This is the Rugged Truth Podcast. I am Dr. Brian Fergus, and I'm so glad you've taken some time out of your busy schedule to participate in this important conversation with us today. It's always a joy and a blessing to be able to record these podcasts and get them out there into the world so that folks can interact with the rugged truth of Scripture and and the person and work of Jesus Christ. I want to talk about Jesus some more today. Probably not a huge surprise. I'm a committed Christian. I believe in the truth of Scripture. I believe that we have an accurate record of the actions that Jesus took on our behalf. I believe we have an accurate record of the things he said in the pages of the Gospels. And so today, we're going to spend some time in those Gospels uh, talking about some more truth about Jesus. We've been digging into some important topics lately here on The Rugged Truth. We've been talking about things like the violence of God. We've been doing our best to explain some difficult uh, passages of Scripture, trying to give people confidence that the Bible doesn't contain mistakes, that we can really trust uh, scripture as a reliable source of truth. Uh, Recently, uh, I posted a a video uh, episode, if you will, of the Rugged Truth podcast called Four Times Jesus Claimed to Be God. It was really interesting. Uh, After uh, posting that video, I got some uh, feedback from a listener. Uh, You know, we post not only videos, but audio uh, podcasts. And a listener uh, contacted me uh, with um, some pushback on the idea that Jesus claimed to be God himself. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. But let let me make it clear up front. Um, The Bible isn't wishy-washy as to uh, the truth of Jesus's divinity the fact that Jesus is God. In fact, I've got my Bible uh, right here, and it's open to the the short New Testament letter of Titus. Uh, Titus chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is writing to his friend Titus, who is pastoring uh, on Crete, and uh, Paul is talking about the, the glorious future we have to look forward to because of our faith in Jesus. And he says this in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, he says, While we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? In that passage, Paul calls Jesus our great God and Savior. You know, there was no question in the minds of the earliest believers, the earliest followers of Jesus, that that he was, in fact, God himself in human flesh. And in the last episode of the Rugged Truth podcast, I should say I know that that not everybody listens to these in order, and and that's totally fine. Uh, It's episode eight, if you're listening on our audio podcasts, and, and the title of the video is just Four Times Jesus Claimed to Be God. In that episode, we looked at four things that Jesus said if you will, that made it very apparent that he understood himself to be God. But like I said, I got a little pushback. And and it was really interesting because, first of all, I I wasn't offended by it at all. If you have criticisms of what I've said, I I really am interested in hearing your opinion. Um, In fact, I was actually exhilarated a little bit because this person took the time to make a comment. It was clear that they were listening from the UK, which was great to know that the Rugged Truth podcast is getting out there. But the the person's main criticism was simply this. Uh, Just because Jesus says these things about himself, it doesn't prove that he is God. Let me state it a different way so that you make sure you get it. His basic argument was, uh, just because Jesus says some things about himself, it doesn't prove that he is God. Now, I could tell from this person's response that they had had missed uh, the, the nuance of what I was talking about. Let me explain. 
When we brought up these four statements that Jesus made about himself, there was no attempt to use them to prove that Jesus is God. I'm a fan of analytic theology, and uh, I've been trained to be very precise with the words I use and the questions that I ask. And, and the question that we were asking really was, did Jesus claim to be God? Uh, this person was responding to a different question, right? We didn't ask, do statements that Jesus made prove that he is God? That's a different question. It's a categorical difference, right? And so what we were simply stating was, look, Jesus made these four statements. Uh, since we believe that the Bible gives us a reliable record of what he said and what he did, from these four statements, it is clear that Jesus understood himself to be God. Does that prove that Jesus is God? No, it doesn't. It just proves that Jesus believed he was God. There's another piece of this equation or formula, if you will, and that is this. Can Jesus' claims be backed up by Jesus' actions? You know, we are uh, people who uh, demand evidence, aren't we? Somebody makes a statement, and we want them to back it up with facts or proof or, or something like that. And so that's going to be the, the focus of uh, our conversation today in this episode of the Rugged Truth Podcast. We're going to look at three things Jesus did to show us that he is God. Right, it'd be one thing if, if we just had his words. And, and listen, I put a lot of credibility in those words. And so don't, don't um, hear me being disrespectful to the words of Jesus or, or, or sacrilegious, if you will, to the words of Jesus. But there are other things that Jesus did that, quite frankly, only God can do that make it abundantly clear that Jesus thought of himself, and acted as if he were God in the flesh. And so th that's really what we're going to talk about in the time we have together today. We're not proving that Jesus is God. We are showing that he claimed to be God through his words and actions. And I hope that distinction is clear. Um, but let's talk about this. Let's talk about three times Jesus claimed to be God with his actions. And, and these are going to be subtle. And, and you might, uh, some of what I say might be new to you. Uh, these are, are common stories. I mean, you've heard them before. They're from the Gospels. Uh, but you might have missed some nuance in these stories. And, and so the first one that I want us to turn to uh, is found in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Now, of course, this is the end of the Gospel of Matthew, toward the end of the Gospel of Matthew, only 28 chapters in that Gospel. And in Matthew chapter 26, we're, we're toward the end of Jesus' life. In fact, in chapter 26, he's going to be um, uh, uh, arrested, and, and there, he'll be in the Garden of Gethsemane. There, there's a lot going on in this passage. And so as, as the evening unfolds, the, the night that Jesus is arrested, he has a conversation with his disciples. Of course, they've been in the upper room, and now they are um, just talking about the events that are about to unfold. And, and Jesus says this in Matthew 26, verse 31. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. He's telling them, look, they're all going to run away from him tonight because of the events that are about to unfold. He's predicting the future there. Now, now maybe that's just a hunch, but look what happens. Peter wants to argue with them. Verse 34, Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, I'm sorry, verse 33, Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. 
right? So Peter's like, look, everybody else might abandon you, Jesus, but not me. I'm, remember, I'm the rock. I'm rock solid. And then Jesus says this in verse 34. Truly, I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Jesus makes the prophetic prediction that, that not only will everybody fall away, but Peter will deny Jesus before the rooster crows. That's, that's a way of saying before the night's over, right? Roosters crow in the morning. They wake people up. Before the night's over, you are going to deny me three times. And then if you move forward into the chapter, Matthew chapter 26, starting with verse 69, you see Peter deny Jesus three times. At the, we'll just look at the last one. Verse 73, after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, one of Jesus' disciples, for your accent betrays you. Apparently people from Galilee had an accent. Verse 74, then he, Peter, began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And that was the third time. Now, this is an interesting event, right? Jesus is telling Peter what's going to happen in the future. And that is stunning. Remember, the topic of our conversation is, is three times Jesus claimed to be God with his actions, or three things Jesus did to show us he is God. And in this passage, Jesus himself exercises the divine attribute of omniscience. Omniscience, there's a big theological word. It, it, it simply means this, all-knowingness, right? And a robust definition of uh, omniscience from a a theological perspective is this, that God knows the past, God knows the present, God knows the future, and God knows the possible. Let me break that down a little bit. God knows what has happened, what is happening, what will happen, and what could happen. That's the omniscience of God. And right here, in this little story that we've all heard before, Jesus exercises the divine attribute of omniscience. He knows what will happen with certainty. I tell you the truth. This is true, Jesus says. Before the night is over, before the the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter does that very thing toward the end of Matthew 26. Some could say, well, you know, Jesus is just making a good guess or it's just a hunch Jesus has because he knows Peter and he knows how tough things are going to get. No, I don't don't see that. Jesus is very specific here. Before the rooster crows, and the text tells us as soon as the rooster crowed, Peter remembered this statement of Jesus, right? The rooster crowed right after the third time he denied him. Jesus by his actions, is demonstrating the divine attribute of omniscience, showing us through his actions that he is God. Now, that's not the only time Jesus acts like God, that he does something that only God can do. There's another story that I want to take you to in Mark chapter 2. So you're in Matthew toward the end of there, if you're following along with me in your Bible. So you just have to flip over a few pages to Mark chapter 2 to another famous story that we know involves uh, the Apostle Peter as well. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus also does something that only God can do. Look at this. Mark 2, I'll start reading with verse 1. And when he, that's Jesus, when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So everybody knew that Jesus was in town again. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. So Jesus is in a home, and he's teaching, and and, and folks are crowding the room, and, and they can't get in. 
And they, some people, came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Remember this story where they climb up on the roof and dig a hole in it? And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Okay, so you get the scene. Big crowd. They can't get through the door. They got a friend that needs to be healed. And by this time, Jesus has quite the reputation as a healer. And so they come to this house, and the other Gospels tell us that this was actually the home of the Apostle Peter. This is where he lived. And they remove part of the roof so that they can lower this guy down in front of Jesus, right? Now, something about this crowd. There's not only people in this crowd who are, you know, are eager to hear what Jesus has to say. There's also quite a few skeptics in this crowd. Look what Jesus says. And when Jesus saw their faith, they've lowered this paralytic. And and what do they want? They, They want him to be healed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Isn't that interesting? Instead of healing this man, Jesus, because they were people of faith, he forgave the sins of this paralytic. The skeptics chime in now. Verse 6, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? Speaking of Jesus, he is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? In other words, when Jesus forgives this paralytic's sins, these guys are are, uh, just spun out. Who does he think he is? Only God can forgive sins. That's what they're suggesting here. Look at verse 8, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? And you know what's about to happen here. But that you may know that the Son of Man, he's speaking of himself, but that you may know that The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he, paralytic, rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. This is this interesting. These folks bring their friend to Jesus to be healed. He forgives his sins, first and foremost. The religious leaders, the scribes who are there, are offended. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, listen, why why does that freak you out that I've forgiven this man's sins? But so that you know I have authority to do that, tell you what, I'm going to make this guy walk. And, of course, he heals the paralytic. He picks up his bed. The paralytic picks up his bed and goes home. The point is simple. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins because he is God. And he didn't just leave it at at saying that about himself. He took it the next step by proving his deity by healing this man of his paralysis. We're talking about things that Jesus did to show us that he's God. He forgave sins. Only God can do that. And if we wonder if he really has the authority and power to forgive sins, well, he went ahead and he healed this man as well. So what do we have so far? What actions do we have Jesus doing that show us that he is God? Well, he exercises omniscience. He knows the future with certainty. He forgives sins. He proves that he has the power and authority to do that by performing a miracle. And then in this third story that I want to take you to uh, today, we see a, a very interesting display of Jesus's godness, if you will. So I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you're following along with me, to Matthew chapter 17. And what we're looking at here is a story that we often call uh, the transfiguration, right? This is uh, during Jesus's ministry and his uh, apostles, are, or his disciples rather, are, are learning from him. He's performing miracles. He's, he's talking to them about what's going to happen in his ministry in the future. 
and we read about a very interesting account. You've heard this before, but I want to read it and make some comments on it, if that's okay. If not, I suppose you're done listening to this today, but I hope you'll hang with me. Matthew chapter 17 says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, James' brother. And he led them up a high mountain by themselves. Now they're in the promised land, right? They're in the land of Canaan. And, he, and, and just the, Jesus takes just these three guys to the top of a mountain. And then verse 2, And he was transfigured before them. Jesus was changed in front of them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, two guys from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, appear there, and they're talking with Jesus. Peter is witnessing this. He's a little freaked out. He said to uh, Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. You know, some shade, I'll build some shade for you. Verse 5, he, Peter, was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. This is a glowing cloud. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified, right? They're hearing a voice from heaven. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. It's a strange afternoon, isn't it? Jesus says, Hey guys, let's go on a hike. He takes them to the top of a mountain. All of a sudden, he's changed. His face shines like a bright light. His clothes are are pure white. And now there are these Old Testament saints, Moses and Elijah, one on either side, Peter recognizes that something uh, special is happening here. They hear a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved beloved son, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. Listen to him, do what he says. What is actually going on here? Why would Jesus do this, right? This is an action Jesus takes. You have to be a bit of a student of the Old Testament to understand that there was a special place where the Hebrews met with God. Mount Sinai. You've heard of that before, right? That's where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Sometimes Sinai is also called Mount Horeb. And what's interesting, as you read the Ten, uh, as you read the Old Testament, uh, Exodus chapter 34, 1 Kings chapter 19, you realize that two men appeared on what they called the mountain of God, Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, and God appeared to them in a partial way. Both of those men were Moses and Elijah. At one point, as uh, Moses is about to leave Mount Sinai, God leads him up and shows him a a part of his glory. Exodus chapter 34. 1 Kings chapter 19, the same mountain, the same cave, Elijah is distraught and he needs an experience of God and the voice of God shows up. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? As God appeared to Moses and Elijah at separate times on the mountain of God, Jesus is appearing to Moses and Elijah on the mountain of transfiguration in the New Testament. Jesus is acting like God. He's doing what only God can do. And to prove that, his countenance changes, his face shines like light, his clothes glow white. Jesus is taking these three actions. He's he's doing what God did in the Old Testament with Moses and Elijah. He's forgiving sins and proving his authority by performing a miracle. And he's demonstrating the divine attribute of omniscience by telling Peter what will certainly happen. And of course, we see that it certainly happened. Jesus is doing these three things, not just as parlor tricks, or cool miracles to impress his friends. Jesus takes these three actions to show us that he is God. And I'm so glad he did. Because it would be one thing if we just had Jesus telling us that he's God. 
But when he acts like God and does things that only God can do, well, that's just further proof that our faith in Jesus is not empty faith, that it's not placed in the wrong man at the wrong time. Jesus is God. And we can walk in that confidence, regardless of what the critics say. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for showing us through your actions in the Gospels that you are God. As we move through our lives, may we walk with the confidence of knowing that we worship a risen Savior who is not just a man, not just an enlightened teacher, but actually God himself in human flesh. Jesus, we ask all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. Jesus is God. It's the heart of our faith, right? God came to us to live among us, to make it possible for us to live with him in eternity. So be confident. Mark those passages that we talked about today in your Bible so that you can turn to them often and regularly. Make little notes in the margins of your Bible. That, that's fair. You ought to do that. Hey, as always, I want to encourage you to like this video. Uh, please be praying for our ministry and subscribe to our YouTube channels and our podcast channels. That really helps get the word out that, that we're around. Of course, share these videos, these podcasts as well so that we can continue the ministry of the rugged truth. God bless you. We'll see you very soon.